Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm very delighted to welcome you to today's event. Um, not every program that we schedule at the Institute is as well-timed as uh, today's event, um, uh, but I do think that this one is particularly well-timed. Um, every four years, uh, the Washington Institute, since its founding um, in uh, the late 80s, has undertaken a number of uh, transition initiatives, um, initiatives that bring together um, foreign policy practitioners from both uh, political parties to address key issues on our Middle East agenda. Um, sometimes we've done grand studies that look at the entire range of Middle East issues. Uh, sometimes we've done more focused topics. Um, and each time uh, we've tried to identify issues that uh, are and ought to be um, on the agenda of the incoming administration, or certainly issues that, that need rethinking and reassessment in moments of transition. Uh, several months ago, um, uh, I approached um, two outstanding foreign policy thinkers, people with great experience, um, uh, both in the administration and on Capitol Hill, at looking at very difficult problems facing our country in the Middle East, and asked them to focus on the question of Egypt. Um, Egypt, of course, the largest, most powerful Arab state, has undergone uh, remarkable change in the last uh, nearly two years, um, and change that, as we can see in our television screens today, is still very much unfinished. Um, uh, and we all thought, uh, first uh, me and then working with uh, my two partners, we thought it was appropriate for us to spend some considerable time and effort focusing on the question of change in Egypt and the future of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship. Uh, to that end, um, I was delighted when uh, uh, Greg Craig and Vin Weber agreed to together form our task force on the future of U.S.-Egyptian relations. Um, we met with uh, senior government officials here in Washington uh, about six weeks ago or so. We, we traveled to the Middle East, um, spent some time in Egypt, meeting with the broad range of Egyptian political figures. Uh, when I say a broad range, this was really everybody from, uh, from Salafists on one end through to uh, liberal secularists on the far other end. Um, we met as broad a range as we could. Uh, we also went up and down the ladder, trying to meet with as senior people as we could. And I think, uh, without mentioning particular names, we met with very senior members of, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, of influential uh, players in the new Egyptian scene, uh, very senior generals, um, uh, um, uh, influential um, people in the, min in the Ministry of Defense, um, the broad range. Um, uh, we also spent um, uh, uh, a brief period in Israel, given the importance of the Egypt-Israel peace to U.S.-Egyptian um, relations and overall American interests in the region, and there met key players in political, military, and diplomatic circles. And throughout, I'm very, very pleased to say that we had uh, excellent cooperation from uh, U.S. officials. Um, especially our ambassadors in, uh, in Egypt and Israel, but also U.S. officials here in Washington, um, um, who were quite uh, supportive of this effort and helpful in, um, uh, in, uh, in, with their time and their insight, thinking about an issue that clearly is going to be near the top of the agenda. Uh, in fact, it already is at the top of the agenda. Um, let me just take a moment to, uh, to thank a couple of people Without whose, uh, without whose help this initiative would never have gotten off the ground. Uh, first, our, my colleague here at the Washington Institute, um, our next generation fellow, Eric Traeger, um, who really is the, um, I think, the most outstanding repository of knowledge about the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, specifically, and current Egyptian politics more generally here in Washington. He, it is, his knowledge is encyclopedic. And I'm very, uh, very delighted that he's with us here at the Institute to share that uh, with the Washington policy community. I'd also like to thank Rebecca Erdman, my assistant, who traveled with us 
to the Middle East and made sure that everything worked so efficiently um, all the way through today. And I'd like uh, to thank our publication staff headed by Mary Horan, who ensured that today we can release this report. It is titled Engagement Without Illusions, Building an Interest-Based Relationship with the New Egypt. Uh, this report, uh, as of the close of today's luncheon, will be available here for you to pick up, as well as online at the Institute's website. Uh, let me now introduce the members of our August task force uh, to, uh, um, as I said, the not only uh, you know, very thoughtful and insightful foreign policy experts, but they are wonderful guys to travel to the Middle East with, especially at the height of the American presidential election campaign. Um, I won't tell you, well, you can figure out for yourself who looked better and who felt better the morning after the first debate when we woke up in Cairo, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, first, let me introduce, uh, I'll introduce both our panelists, um, uh, Vin Weber. Um, uh, Vin uh, served as a, a, a member of Congress from the state of Minnesota, um, an elected member of the House Republican leadership. Uh, uh, in, uh, in his civic life, uh, Vin has served as the chairman of the National Endowment of Democracy. He's a trustee of the Aspen Institute. Um, uh, um, he has um, been a major player at, uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he's also on the board. Um, uh, it's really um, a pleasure to have Vin's experience and insight contributing to this, to this enterprise. Um, uh, also, um, uh, let me introduce Gregory B. Craig. Uh, Greg has been a uh, farm policy practitioner at both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue for um, more than the last quarter century. Um, service as the uh, senior foreign policy and defense advisor to uh, Senator Kennedy. Um, uh, then uh, serving in the Clinton administration as uh, uh, director of, of um, policy planning in the State Department. And more recently um, as uh, President Obama's uh, um, White House counsel. Um, in the early part of the Obama administration. Um, both these gentlemen have, outs have uh, very successful private uh, careers um, in law and uh, in strategic advising. Um, uh, for our purposes, um, we, we drew upon uh, um, their, uh, um, the wealth of their knowledge in understanding the policy process and the issues of uh, um, uh, confronting America in the Middle East for this report. Um, uh, uh, this report is their report. Um, the Washington Institute is very proud to have um, uh, provided them with the ability to travel to the Middle East, to talk with people, um, um, uh, uh, but it's their names on their report. And I believe that uh, uh, the value of their association with this report and with the ideas therein will make sure that it is read um, broadly and deeply uh, in Congress, the administration, and, and by all Americans who care about um, not just U.S.-Egypt relations, but America's broader interests in the Middle East. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Mr. Craig, who will uh, open our presentation. Um, he will then turn to Mr. Weber, and at the end, uh, we'll have uh, opportunity for, uh, to address your questions. Greg? Thank you. Um, thank you, Rob. Uh, I've been trying to understand why you picked me for this job, and now you've explained it to me. But I would like to say at the very beginning that um, the Institute has been a terrific partner in this, and Rob and Eric and Rebecca really ran a really great ship, and I want to thank them. Uh, Vin will probably say the same thing, but there are many challenges putting together the kinds of meetings that we had uh, in Cairo and in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. and. Uh, those challenges were met and surpassed every time. I would also like to say a word or two about Vin. Vin, um, it was a real treat to work with Vin. Uh, and he's part of the bipartisan uh, coalition that came together to do this. Uh, he was steady and sane and sensible <clears throat> and serious and smart. And I couldn't help but think he was more like a Democrat than a Republican. <laughs> he's just been a terrific partner and a friend on this project. And I've valued the relationship. Um, <laughs> now, the, the third thing I have to say by way of introduction is um, I am not an expert on Egypt by any means. And there are dozens of people in this audience 
um, who have a greater right to be speaking today about not only the history of our relationship, but what has been happening in the last 24 hours. Um, but I should tell you that being a lawyer, I am shameless, and I have no hesitation about talking confidently <laughs> about anything and everything uh, that I know nothing about. Um, now, Mr. Satloff suggested that I begin by talking about why Egypt is important to us, strategically, politically, economically. And I would only say that uh, I don't think this crowd needs to be lectured on why Egypt is important to us. In my own life, for example, one of my earliest, this will tell you exactly how old I am, one of my earliest memories is the Suez Canal crisis, I'm watching Gamal um, Nasser on television. And since then, throughout my life, there's been punctuations of events associated with Egypt that the United States cared enormously about, not just because of the Cold War, not just because of U.S.-Israel uh, relations, but because of the impact that what happens in Egypt ha influences the whole world. Now, I know that Egyptians love to hear that because Egypt is at the center of the universe in their own minds, but is in fact true in many respects. That in my own life, what has happened in Egypt has affected the way in which um, we view the rest of the world. Um, now, we find ourselves in another equally important moment. Um, from the various moments of great history in Egypt's relationship with the United States and with Israel. Uh, but this moment is particularly interesting because it's filled with so many changes and transitions and, and lack of prediction. Now, I will tell you, uh, Rob gave you a little bit of a hint as to when we were over there. We were over there at the end of September and into November. October 3rd was the date of the first debate. I will never forget that date. <laughs> Uh, so we were there m many uh, weeks before uh, the events of recent history, and our report was largely completed by the time, certainly before the Gaza um, uh, conflict, certainly before um, the most recent events having to do with the power grab and the demonstrations. Um, and so many of the things we're going to say are somewhat dated because they're not taking these recent events into account. I think we're happy to talk about these recent events, but let us give you some impression of what we found when we were there in October. Um, the, the country had just gone through huge events. Uh, Mubarak had, um, had gone. Uh, there'd been a 13-month transition uh, presided over by the military. The military was gone. Um, we had the first uh, free presidential election uh, in 6,000 years of Egypt history, and we had a brotherhood president. Um, those facts had all occurred in the recent past, and were still very much alive in the minds of the people that we were talking to. And just by way of introduction, I do think that what happens in Egypt tomorrow and certainly in the next months, if not years, is of huge consequence, not only to the region, but to us as Americans and to the world. Um, for example, if the treaty with Israel is not respected, we will be at risk of another war in the region. If the new rulers of Egypt indulge or protect terrorists, whether in the Sinai and Gaza or elsewhere in the region, we and our friends will be at risk of another attack. Uh, if the economy of the largest Arab state comes crashing down, uh, Egypt may fail as a state. Internal chaos could become chronic. We see some evidence of that today. Uh, and even more extreme Islam Islamists may assume power. And the entire region may suffer and be thrown into a depression. And the final comment, if democracy is snuffed out in Egypt, what does that mean for the Arab Spring generally? Uh, will it have an impact on those reformers who want change but are worried about substituting uh, one authoritarian person for another? Now, we, as Rob said, we spent five days, six days in Egypt talking to all sorts of people. Um, and it's interesting in my own memory, I, they're all very clear. I have specific and very clear-cut memories of the conversations with, with each of them. And what I would like to do would be to make, maybe like make four observations and then raise a number of questions uh, that still are unanswered that we could not answer. And then Vin will talk a little bit more about the, the policy recommendations and why we came out where we came out. Um, we came away <laughs> having talked with the Salafists and representatives, various representatives of the Brotherhood, plus secular liberal activists. We came away with a strong feeling that the process 
that dramatic change is not over. In fact, the revolution could be perceived as still continuing. There is the possibility, depending on what happens with the military and the Brotherhood, of a counter-revolution occurring. Um, the, the simple and honest way of putting it is that there are no rules governing this transition. And the only entity capable, capable of enforcing any rules is the military, and it seems to have made its peace with the Brotherhood. So my advice to those who care about this part of the world is to buckle your seat belts. The road is going to be very bumpy. The, the second observation I would make is, and this is not new, I think anybody who follows this carefully sees this every day, that the real tension for President Morsi is between the demands of governing and the reality of the economic crisis and whether he can do that while remaining true to the basic tenets of the Brotherhood from whence he comes. That tension is there every day and it's already very much in evidence and he moves back and forth between those demands. The third point I would make, uh, and I think we found this to be uh, disconcertingly true, that the non-Islamic forces in Egypt are disorganized, depressed, and disheartened um, and angry. What has happened in the recent hours may galvanize them and bring them together in opposition to uh, what President Morsi has done. But our experience with them was that they did not have energy, they had no clear direction, uh, they had no plan of coming together that seemed effective, and they had no basic experience about how to deal with constituent local politics in such a fashion that organizing their political constituency could challenge the organizations of the Islamists. Um, right now, the U.S. is not uh, well thought of by the secular liberal forces in Egypt. They believe that we actually are responsible for putting the Brotherhood in power after the election. And um, they also, and this is becoming clear, I think, believe that we would settle for protecting the treaty with Israel, between Egypt and Israel, at the expense of democracy inside Egypt. So this is a real challenge, I think, for American policy makers going forward. And one of the recommendations that we make is that we engage more fully with various segments of Egyptian society. Right now, the engagement is more, more complete with the Islamic sections, and there is a um, tendency to ignore uh, these other groups largely because of the reasons I explained to you. Their anger at us and their um, inability to organize themselves seriously. The fourth, the fourth thing I would say has to do with something that I think James Carville said many years ago. It's the economy, stupid. The economy in Egypt is in such dire straits, gridlock in the cities, <clears throat> power shortages. When we drove in, there were big chunks of the city that were dark that had no power in it. Um, unsustainable subsidies of food and fuel. Um, massive structural deficits uh, that who knows how they make it up. Export, uh, imports of food required. That Morsi's focus on this problem um, is a requirement, it's a good sign, um, but whether he is successful in managing it um, is the big question and what happens if he fails is another question that we should be thinking about. Now, those are my four observations. There, there are a bunch of questions that I came away with, that we came away with, that we think are important questions uh, that we cannot answer yet, but will, when they do get answered in the course of history, are going to tell us where we're at. The question number one is, is President Morrissey bigger than the Brotherhood? Is he a national figure? Is he someone who can represent all components of the Egyptian society? Or will he be uh, a national leader of the Brotherhood, uh, essentially adhering to the faithful requirements of membership in the Brotherhood? That is an, a question that reflects my comment about the tension that exists uh, in Morsi's life. The second question is, um, which we can't answer with confidence yet, is who is actually running Egypt today? Is it Morsi and the people immediately around him? 
um, and the members of his government who are trying to solve problems and develop policies? Or is it the leadership of the Brotherhood? I should tell you, John Podesta, who was over there some months before us and came back um, to make a report similar to this, said he thought the country was being run like a think tank with a bunch of people circulating. He, he should know about how a think tank is run. But that was his judgment. This thing takes a, is a dictatorship. <laughs> the, um, the, the third question is, has to do with the Brotherhood itself. Is the Brotherhood monolithic? Um, is it run by a Leninist central style, of, a central committee style of governance? Or is there more flexibility, more fluidity? Uh, do they have the uh, ca capacity to impose uh, their positions on all the members? Or is there some degree of pluralism within the Brotherhood? Um, are some of the leaders more accessible and flexible than others? I will tell you, we had an interesting meeting with one of the leaders of the Brotherhood uh, in the evening in, in a building that can only be characterized as the Temple of Mordor. It had huge <laughs> structures all around, and, we, and it was empty. So when we walked in, our foot, you know, they could, you could hear our clicking feet as they went down. <laughs> and um, met with this man in, in a darkened room. And very early on, the question of the treaty came up and uh, asked the question as to whether his understanding was that the government was going to respect this treaty in all its permutations. And he said, yes, he reassured us that that was going to happen. I said, well, does that mean that the Brotherhood is prepared to recognize the right of Israel to exist? <laughs> and he moved very quickly in the other direction. He said, Egypt has existed for 6,000 years and Israel has existed for only 60 years. And then he went on to give us a lecture about how Israel came into being. And so there is that uh, existing dichotomy that, that uh, is very powerful and very palpable still. Uh, I think it's, uh, it would be a mistake for US policymakers to treat the Brotherhood as monolithic um, when a more nuanced approach might, in fact, um, at least in the, in the first instance, might produce greater flexibility on their part. Um, the fourth question, what is the true basis for the Islamic uh, electoral success in Egypt? Um, is it the fact that the majority of Egyptians support an Islamic future for the country? Or is it the fact that they were just better organized than everybody else? Or is it the fact that they had more credibility coming out of the Mubarak era than any other organized group and a vote for um, the Brotherhood candidate was a vote against Mubarak. Um, or is it a little of all of the above? Uh, the, the depth of Islamic support among the Egyptian people to me is still an open question. There are clearly very powerful moments and positions and locations of Islamic uh, strength, particularly Alexandria with the Salafists. And I have to say that our meeting with the Salafists was a very important learning experience for me. They were all young. They all arrived with laptops and opened them up. They were all dressed in a Western style. Uh, I think the oldest was 28. Um, they declined to shake hands with Rebecca, who was a member of our delegation, but spoke um, comfortably, professionally, and um, quite impressively about their mission, which was uh, dictated to them by Allah, which was to serve the people. Um, and I guess there was some debate going on inside their movement and inside their party as to the extent the Salafists would be engaging in electoral politics. Uh, the fourth, or the fifth question that I already described is, can the non-Islamic political forces work together? Can they organize effectively? And how can we help them without being viewed as working for regime change and losing our ability to influence Morrissey. Sixth question, how cowed, how subservient, how irrelevant is the army today? I can't, given my uh, own experience, dismiss the army out of hand. They've got an enormous amount of economic power. They also are a national institution that is revered and respected by the Egyptian people. And there are accommodations that are being made with the, the Brotherhood uh, may well be uh, simply to give the Brotherhood the rope they need to hang themselves. 
And I think one of the sad things that might emerge out of this is if the civilian side, the Egyptian population, is unable to govern themselves, then in a Pakistani kind of way, the Egyptian military may move in and out of the barracks and into the streets again. And the final question I've got, uh, and I don't know if anybody can answer this question, is whether there is any deep appreciation in the Egyptian people, among the Egyptian people, for the benefits of the peace that they've had with Israel over the last 35 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> it's reasonable. All right, now let's correct some of that. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's going to answer all the questions. No, it was, uh, first of all, it's great to be with all of you here today, and I want to echo what uh, Greg said about the tremendous job that the Institute uh, did in pulling this together uh, and really uh, uh, helping us to be successful in this project. Uh, Rob is a great, great leader and great partner. Uh, Eric Traeger uh, is uh, the emerging expert on this region of the world, and uh, it was tremendous to have him there with us, although I think at any moment if there had been a riot, his, in, in, his, in, his inclination would have been to pull us into it rather than out of it uh, so that we could report on it firsthand. And Rebecca, Rebecca kept us all sane even when people wouldn't shake her hand. Um, uh, and let me say uh, also it was a tremendous uh, pleasure. Uh, Greg and I have known each other for a long time. We haven't really worked uh, closely together uh, on, on things until now, but it was a lot of fun. He is, of course, one of the uh, most prominent lawyers in Washington. That, that means he bills by the hour, and I'll, I'll speak more briefly than he did. And that's the reason why. <laughs> um, it was fun being over there uh, on the night of that first debate, which is actually the last thing I remember about the campaign. <laughs> uh, I'm told Obama won the election, but I'm trying. Anyway, uh, we, we didn't have any real problems getting along. We had a couple of cultural incidents, but. Greg backed off on his initial insistence that we conduct all our discussions in French. <laughs> and uh, and uh, as he mentioned to you, he had some initial problems dealing with the Salafists, but you know, I'm a Republican, religious fundamentalist, or nothing new to me. So, <laughs> so we, actually, uh, we actually overcame a couple of these initial cultural political barriers quite well. And uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun working with him and with the people from the Institute. Um, I want to just make reference, uh, Greg has really framed our analysis of what we saw and how we're looking at the situation. I'm going to try to get right into some of the things that we recommend, which are in the report that's in front of you. I do want to mention there's a number of people in the room that were involved with me uh, several years ago in a project for the Council on Foreign Relations that I co-chaired with Secretary Albright on democracy in the Arab world. And I don't want to claim too much prescience, but those of you that were involved in that, remember we talked at that point about the likelihood that something which we now refer to as the Arab Spring would at some point occur somewhere in the Arab world. And when it did, something like the Muslim Brotherhood would probably emerge because the space in those societies, particularly in Egypt, had been crowded out for everybody except Muslim extremists. So it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not entirely a new experience for me to go up, gone back and seen what actually happened in this country after that, that came about. Um, and I think that's the reality that we are, we are living with uh, now. And uh, much of our country has, I think, and much of the Western world has reacted kind of with horror to the emergence of, uh, of an Islamic government or a Muslim Brotherhood-led government in Egypt and are thinking about different ways that we should react to this. Uh, there's kind of three general approaches that we might take and which we talk about a little bit in the report, uh, specifically to come to the conclusion that we shouldn't do two of them, but it's worth, think worth, worth thinking about. There are those who argue we could simply jump in and rescue Egypt right now. We have a lot of leverage. We have the leverage of the one and a half uh, billion dollars in aid we provide a annually to them, most of it military, but some domestic as well, uh, as well as our leverage through the IMF. And I think when we talk about leverage, we have to always remember that's really the tip of the iceberg. U.S. aid and our, our influence through the IMF is more important to them in terms of what it will leverage in terms of foreign investment than in, in terms of anything else. As we met with the government, 
Uh, the good news was that they really seemed to focus on uh, the economic problems first and foremost, at least they said they did. Um, the bad news from my standpoint is their economic strategy can probably be reduced to one sentence, we intend to attract foreign investment. There isn't a second sentence. Uh, the United States has huge leverage because if we were to conclude that this is an unworkable situation and decide to pull the plug, uh, both on our aid and on the aid over which we have influence such as the IMF and on uh, direct foreign, foreign investment over which we have some influence, it would really do enormous, enormous damage to the country. So we could go in and rescue Egypt uh, and prop up the government immediately uh, without condition. Uh, the second alternative is the opposite, and that is to pull the plug and basically say uh, we would prefer to see this, this Islamic government collapse. Uh, there is no way we can reconcile ourselves to them. A lot of arguments made against the government, arguments why we should not want to see them succeed. Uh, we're concerned about their treatment of religious minorities, the cops particularly. We're concerned about their treatment of women's rights. We're concerned about their relationship with Israel uh, and a group of other issues that all could lead us to the conclusion this is not going to be a workable situation. Uh, let's pull the plug and let them go down. Let them become a failed state. We actually had people in Egypt, Egyptians, our, our members of the opposition argue to us that that's the approach the United States should take. Pull our aid, kill the IMF funding, discourage foreign investment, let Egypt collapse, and something new will emerge in its place. <clears throat> we believe that both of those approaches, and we came to this conclusion after really discussing all of them with various people, are far, far too risky. On the one hand, uh, we have enough concerns, I think, about the way, the direction that this government will proceed uh, to not want to become, if you will, an enabler and allow our aid to simply prop up a government and allow them to proceed in any direction that they want to proceed. <clears throat> it is good news that they say that the economy is their number one concern, that their 100-day agenda, which we laughed at a lot, does focus on rather concrete things like traffic and congestion and garbage congestion and garbage collection and things like that, as opposed to broader theological and geostrategic objectives. We should keep them focused on those things and providing aid with no conditions might simply enable them to move in other directions. So we reject that approach. By the same token, uh, we came pretty quickly to the conclusion that allowing Egypt to become a failed state really is about the worst possible solution for the United States, for, the, for Israel, for the region, and really for the world. This is a nation of 80 million plus people. It is the center of Arab culture in many ways, certainly the leading nation of the Arab world, uh, a nation that is at a pivotal point both in terms of its relationship with Asia and its leadership of Africa, which President Morsi wants to exert even more. For that state to become a failed state would have consequences, some of which we can envision, many of which we can't. So we reject that full score. Which leads to the third alternative, and again, this is not something that no one has discussed before, but conditionality has been discussed from time to time, even during the, new, the Mubarak regime. Should we put conditions on the aid that we, supp we supply to them to try to achieve certain objectives? It was always rejected when Mubarak was in power, uh, and I have to say I probably was among those that argued that we shouldn't do that at that time. Uh, but it constitutes, we think, the best third-way alternative uh, given what's at stake in that country uh, right now. Uh, we have to, as we approach this policy, which would be a new policy for our government, uh, there are three things that we think the government needs to keep in mind in addressing it. First of all, uh, as we emphasize in the report, there has to be absolute clarity about what is at stake for Egypt in terms of the conditionality that we put on our aid. There can't be any misunderstanding about what we might do or what they might do, what we expect of them, what they can expect of us. Second of all, it requires us, really, to do some serious prioritization. What is it that we really care about in terms of the relationship with this government? Uh, the relationship has shifted. Uh, it's clear that President Morsi is looking in other directions for relationships, some of them in the region. Uh, he's already been to Turkey, obviously, and Iran, also broader than the region, China. Uh, and we should not uh, uh, assume that we can simply present a list of everything that we care about and have it adhered to. What do we really care about? What really matters? On what are we really willing to stake 
the relationship with Egypt and put it at some, at some risk. Because key to this policy of conditionality, of course, has to be the possibility that if the conditions that we lay out are not met, we're ready to act and withdraw aid. And that would be a tough decision for our government. And the worst way we could proceed to that is without having prioritized our own interests in our own mind and made it clear to the Egyptians as well as to our own Congress, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, uh, in the process. <clears throat> there are three, then, baskets, as we put it, of interests that we think we need to think about when talking about this uh, issue of the conditionality of our aid and really of our broader relationship with Egypt. The first is regional peace. And uh, as, as Rob uh, talked about, it's kind of interesting that these issues have come so much to the forefront just at this moment that, as Greg said, this was not our intention to release this report in response to anything happening immediately. But certainly as we looked at, this, at the relationship that we have with Egypt, um, Israel, Gaza, and reason, regional peace are at the very top of our priority list. They have to be partners in helping to preserve the peace, in helping to, to obviously to maintain the agreements with Israel, and to address the critical issues in Gaza, which we talk about later on uh, also in the report. Second of all, there is a different level of strategic cooperation, which mainly involves our relationship with the military. And since most of our aid is to the military, uh, that also is a clear and important uh, basket of interest for us it involves the Suez, military cooperation, cooperation against terrorism, issues like that. And then the third issue, uh, which we frame as constitutional democracy and pluralism. How do we actually look at Egypt's uh, emerging democracy, their treatment of, uh, of the different sensitive issues that are emerging in the constitutional process, and as we've talked about in other parts of the world, uh, we don't want to be in a situation of supporting a nation that believes in one man, one vote, one time. There has to be an ongoing commitment to what I term and we term in the report constitutional democracy, as well as pluralism, but admittedly within the context of an Egyptian and an Islamic culture, not the same as we practice in America, but uh, that's got to be respected as the process goes, goes forward. The implementation of this principle of conditionality, I think we look at it in a couple of different ways, and I would say it requires, obviously, a lot of very skillful diplomacy. Part of it is formal and open, and we suggest that the President should annually certify to the Congress of the United States cooperation from the Egyptian government on those most important strategic considerations, uh, particularly on the area, in the issues related to regional peace and strategic cooperation, things that can be fairly clearly identified and that, that, that directly affect uh, the security interests of the United States and of Egypt and its neighbors in the region. That should be done on a formal basis, openly and annually. But perhaps even more important, as we emphasize, are the informal con uh, communications that American diplomats at every level, <clears throat> and I would even add non-diplomatic Americans who interact with the Egyptians, have uh, over the issues that we're talking about. Uh, we need to emphasize, I would say, perhaps given my background, to the Egyptian government uh, privately and perhaps publicly somewhat as well, but certainly informally, that the administration can conduct foreign policy, but they can only do it in this country with an eye toward public opinion and at the end of the day with an eye toward Congress, particularly when it comes to the issues that are sort of at the core of conditionality, the supplying of one and a half billion dollars in aid every year. And they need to understand that some of the issues that may concern, they may consider internal issues, treatment of women, religious liberties, issues like that, may not be considered internal issues by members of Congress when they decide that they're going to have to vote to cut all sorts of programs on the domestic American budget and yet supply a billion and a half dollars in aid to Egypt. Those are messages that we believe need to be conveyed to the Egyptians, but certainly need to be conveyed at an informal level <coughs> rather than a formal uh, level as, as we talked about with the President a minute ago. Finally, we think that the flashpoint in this entire uh, region, of course, the, the in relationship uh, has been and can be the Sinai, and we suggest special steps need to be taken in regard to our relationship to Egypt and their conduct in the Sinai. We suggest earmarking about $100 million of military aid 
uh, to actually dealing with security problems and terrorism within Sinai. We understand the military probably won't like that. They'd rather have it without earmarks. Um, but we think that that's very important. We also think that it's important to emphasize to the Egyptians that they have responsibilities to look toward the economic development of the Sinai, which has been badly ignored under the previous government as well, and which is underlies and encourages a lot of the problems uh, that we're having there. So that's the, the devotion to the Sinai and encouragement to the Egyptians to take their responsibilities seriously there, we think, uh, is really important. Uh, so that's the, the substance of our set of recommendations. Uh, we look forward to discussing them in the time we have remaining. Uh, I'd only add, in terms of the kind of the long-term advice, uh, Greg used the phrase that I was going to use, our advice to the government, which I would call the Betty Davis uh, policy, uh, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Just very quickly add one thing to Vince's summary of our recommendations, which was absolutely perfect. There are two aspects about conditionality that I would like to stress, because I know that there are many people that are uncomfortable with this kind of, uh, this kind of a policy that conditions our relationship on the satisfaction of conditions. I don't think you can defend and sustain a policy of engagement over time with Egypt without conditionality. It's a reality. It's a political reality at home um, that, that, Vince meant, that, that Vin mentioned, and I, I totally agree with it. It's, it's de facto if it's not even if it's not public. You cannot defend giving this amount of aid to a country that does not respect its peace treaty with Israel, does not work with us on terrorism, does not coordinate with our military. Um, the second thing, uh, which I agree with Vin on, is the way in which this conditionality is, the message is delivered to the Egyptians, I think is very important. Because if it's done as an ultimatum, or if it's done as a, a deadline or a requirement, or even in a quid pro quo kind of fashion, um, their backs will get up and it'll be counterproductive. So it's got to, this is where we really need diplomacy. Uh, from the president as well as from the members of, of Congress. Um, and, but it's, the, the political reality is that there is conditionality in our future relationship with uh, Egypt. It's worth the effort to engage on a broad front with the Egyptians. Um, and so I think to defend that policy of engagement, you have to recognize that these conditions exist. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope uh, that gives you a sense of what is in this report. Um, you have uh, an op-ed in front of you that appeared in today's LA Times, which gives you 950 words about the report. Um, if you check on the blog of uh, the New York Times, you'll see um, that Peter Baker did a story this morning, which, uh, which talks about how um, this report um, uh, uh, occupies the middle ground on the emerging debate over Egypt. Um, uh, and I think that is a very uh, accurate and sober assessment of where these gentlemen um, uh, have come out. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to your questions. Um, uh, uh, please recognize that while there is so much news happening in Egypt today, um, uh, uh, um, Vin and Greg um, uh, um, are focused principally on the recommendations and the analysis that they, uh, that they presented uh, in the report. Um, start with uh, uh, Nick on my right. And if you could just wait for the mic to come to you, I would be grateful. Hi, I'm Nick Rostow from the National Council University. Uh, question uh, for both of you. I uh, appreciate your report and, and uh, uh, Greg, maybe uh, the recommendation for uh, certification to Congress is part of this. It's fine. Go ahead. The president uh, no longer has you as his counsel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, how is that uh, consistent with your advice not to, to make conditionality in the form of an ultimatum? I, I completely agree with the substance of conditionality. So my question really is, a, is as to do with form, not substance, and whether uh, recommending a, a certification to Congress doesn't um, 
put us back in the sort of Pressler Amendment mode and uh, rub it in the eyes uh, or in the nose or dirt of the Muslim Brotherhood in a way that could be counterproductive. Uh, Nick, I would agree with you if this was legislation requiring the President to, to do it. This is something the President will do on his own. Uh, this is something that he can do through the Secretary of State testifying in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee or in the House. It is something that uh, the Egyptians have to recognize that we have to do for ourselves. We have to satisfy ourselves, and the President is the person, the vehicle to do this, satisfy ourselves that these particular strategic interests of the United States are being respected, and that this relationship and the assistance that we're providing um, is not feckless. And so it, it does seem to me an important point to make, that this is the President's policy. Uh, it's not a requirement of law. Um, and it's informing the Egyptians that these basic interests of the United States are so central that the relationship and our assistance would be jeopardized if they're not respected. That's all. Uh, Judith, on my left. I was going to wait a few minutes, but <clears throat> excuse me. But I want to uh, take the opportunity to say I totally disagree with the idea of conditionality. What we're seeing now is a blip in, a blip in the history of a 7,000-year-old homogeneous country. I mean, the 7,000 years really runs in the blood of the Egyptians. How can the Egyptian public, who hates us right now for a lot of good reasons, because we supported for 30 years a dictator who kept them quiet at any price. And we thought quiet was stability. It turns out quiet is not stability, not in Egypt or anywhere else in the region. If now, because they have an Islamic government, oh my God, and we're so terrified of that, if we now make it conditional, why should the Egyptian people look to the ideals and values that we, the Americans, would like them to, to adopt? Give them a chance. Give them some time. The three things that, uh, uh, Greg, you mentioned, uh, uh, military cooperation, terrorism, and the, the Sinai, and what they're going to do with the Gaza tunnels now is, is a very important place. And uh, the third thing was uh, keeping the treaty. They're not stupid. They get that. But we got to work with them. They need help to control the Sinai. They need help to take control again of the Gaza, of the uh, Egyptian side of the Gaza openings. If we don't give them a chance, and we say, oh, Mubarak was okay, he tortured people, we couldn't even act to get Saadine Ibrahim out, and oh my God, we couldn't do a thing against him. But now, because it's an Islamic government, duly elected, I would say, that we make it conditional, we are going to lose Egypt. This is a hundred year, a thousand year project. This is not between today, tomorrow, and the end of the Obama administration or the end of the next administration. So I'd like you to really comment on how you see conditionality because if the Congress gets a hold of conditionality, Egypt is gone. And if Egypt's gone, so is everybody else. <laughs> what do you really think? <laughs> um, Judith's taught me a lot of what I believe about the Middle East, so it's hard for me to disagree, but I do disagree, Judith. I want to emphasize what, what Greg said and what I believe. Conditionality, I, conditionality is as much, if not more, aimed at us as a tool to maintain the relationship that you correctly describe as so important as it is aimed at the Egyptians. As we, just before we went over there, uh, you might all recall, uh, Rand Paul introduced an amendment to cut uh, the, the, to end aid to Egypt. And at the end of the day, after a considerable struggle uh, that preoccupied the State Department, a lot of the leaders of Congress, they managed to beat him back and he only got about 10 votes. <clears throat> I do remember thinking I was, A, happy that they beat him back, and B, glad that I didn't have to go back and run for re-election in Minnesota explaining that I had just voted to give a billion and a half dollars, or not to cut a billion and a half dollars, to a, a, to a government that most of my constituents think now is quite hostile to our values and to the United States and to Israel. <clears throat> I agree with you it's a longer term enterprise. We need to educate the country. A lot of what we're talking about here is to give America time to figure out its relationship with this very new government. And in that, in that context, the conditionality we're talking about is a way 
of assuring Americans that we are not simply writing a blank check. And I'll add to this, because you know, domestic politics has kind of been my thing. We're asking the Congress to make very painful decisions about raising taxes and cutting benefits to the American people. It is not easy to ask them to support foreign aid to anybody, much less a government that they believe is hostile to our values and hostile to our interests. So we believe that the conditionality is not a threat to the relationship, <clears throat> will not sink the relationship, in fact, as a way of sustaining it on the right basis. Uh, yes, on the on the right there. Um, no, you, yes, your turn. If you could uh, take the mic and identify yourself. Sure, David Galbraith. <coughs> That's fine. From the State Department at Georgetown University this year. <coughs> I had uh, uh, two questions. The first is, you chose to make uh, sort of an informal posi uh, uh, conditionality position the bucket of constitutional measures, uh, protection of minorities, women. Yet you also identified the sort of secular non-Islamist forces in Egypt as thinking that you, the United States, you know, didn't care about them and um, was responsible for the Morsi government coming into power. So, how do you reconcile that, and why did you um, make that condition sort of an informal one versus a formal one like the other two? And then, secondly, just more broadly with conditionality, you say that you would want a very well-defined uh, set of, of conditions and well communicated and clearly understood. Um, on some other issues I've covered, it's my experience that that's actually quite hard to achieve. Would you actually break the conditions down further besides the sort of top line issues you presented here, i.e. what does support on regional peace mean, or would you just leave it at that level? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think the distinction between the strategic interests and the military interests um, that the United States has in its relationship with Egypt, um, and the, the distinction we make between those and the internal uh, activities that may lead to a uh, provision in the Constitution that we don't like about the treatment of women or the treatment of minorities, uh, I think that's an appropriate distinction to make. We have standing as a government and as uh, our own country to care about international um, agreements. We have standing to care our about our own strategic uh, interests. We have standing to care about our friends in the region, how they're treated. We have standing to care about whether terrorists are allowed to function and or whether a government um, does not contribute. We have standing to care about whether a government uh, assists us in the peace process or undermines the peace process. There's no doubt about that. And so I think that's why those first two baskets are much more sort of hardline uh, defined interests. This, we are concerned about being seen as interfering in the internal affairs of the Egyptians. We have views about how people should be treated and we shouldn't be afraid to express those views. Uh, and there is the political reality that if they uh, adopt a constitution that puts women in a position of, of second-class citizenship, does not give them adequate education, there's going to be a response inside the United States of America. This, this whole question of conditionality should be viewed through the prism of domestic politics that allows us to carry on a robust and wide-ranging policy of engagement with Egypt. Um, the, the second thing is I would keep, uh, I would keep the, the first two baskets in a general fashion rather than a specific fashion. Because the more you get specific, the more it does look like uh, specific demands, a quid pro quo. If you don't do this, then we'll do this. Uh, th they understand. I mean, the Egyptians, uh, to quote Judith, the Egyptians are not stupid. They know exactly what our concerns are. And if they allow terrorists to occupy Sinai and attack Israel, they know we're going to be concerned about that. Uh, they know that will disrupt the nature of our relationship on a military basis and an intelligence basis. And I don't think we have to really say, don't let terrorists run around to the Sinai. Uh, do not support uh, terrorist organizations in, inside Egypt to the extent that um, uh, those uh, interests are clearly defined as been suggested. I think it provides us enough clarity um, and direct understanding with Egyptians that there'll be no mistakes. I just want to talk for, for a second about our relation, the, the relationship with 
uh, non-Islamic opposition in Egypt? Because we, we think that's where Greg has, I think, answered your question pretty thoroughly. But one of the things we found that surprised me, and I think surprised both of us, was a great deal of consistency among the people that we met with in Egypt who were part of the opposition, a wide variety of, of people from different points of opposition, as well as in Israel, almost all of whom thought we had had some role in installing, if you will, the Muslim Brotherhood as the government in Egypt. Now, in some cases, that was a, stated a little more diplomatically, in some cases a little more strongly. And I want to emphasize, that's not what we believe, but it was surprising to us the number of people in the, who might be called in the opposition that really did believe that. Uh, so it's, we get back to the, it, it's a very delicate and confused situation over there for everybody right now. We've outlined what we think is a way of engaging with this government, respecting the government, trying not to interfere in the internal politics of the country. But at the same time, we make the recommendation very clearly in the report that the government should engage as much as they can with non-governmental actors, with members of the secular opposition. They are not today organized uh, politically. They may be organized in Tahrir Square. We'll find out a little bit more this weekend. But they are not organized as a political opposition. But we believe it's very important to keep in touch with those people and to maintain lines of communication. After all, this government, uh, you know, only won with 52% of the vote, and their share of the vote declined in each one of the successive elections they had. Uh, there still is a lot of opposition in that country, and we don't know the direction that it may go in the future. It's in our interests, and it's wise for us, as well as for the Egyptians, for us to maintain uh, contact and communication with all the players in Egypt, including those that are in opposition. Uh, yes, uh, Mike. Right yeah. Mike yeah. Thanks very much for the presentation. I, I had a question on, on the, related to the Egyptian economy. As you all, you all know, tourism is a big component. Was there any discussion of that in your, uh, in your uh, discussions, uh, the tourism trade? <clears throat> because when you talk about the Sinai, for example, $100 million that you, you propose to uh, deal with terrorism there, I mean, that's in the Egyptian self-interest. I mean, I, I still remember after Luxor uh, attacks that, you know, the foreign tourism uh, went way downhill, and every time there's unrest in the Middle East, uh, uh, it, the Egyptian economy seems to take a knocking. Did that loom into it? Because it seems to me that if you're going to talk about conditions, one aspect of putting it in their own self-interest, and one of it is to bolster the tourism trade. The other, so the other issue on, on the jobs, and they t when they talk about uh, foreign investment, do they discuss any measures to make it easier for, for investors to, to uh, you know, get the permits and things needed to, say, set up factories or, or operations there? Because that's been a real uh, impediment in the past. Um, I'll, I'll answer briefly, and then Greg may want to answer, too. Uh, tourism, as you know, has been killed recently by what's going on over there. And we did talk to a number of people, but more not people in government, more people in the business community and elsewhere that we're keenly aware of this for exactly the reasons that you cited. And that is, in, it is in the interests of the government. I, I have to emphasize again, the government says consistently that their number one goal is the economy. And I, uh, you know, I don't want to sound cynical about it. I do think that they understand that their survival as a government longer term depends on reviving the economy and putting the economy back on a, on a growth path. So they have to pay some attention to these things. But I also want to emphasize, when they talk about strategies for, direct, for encouraging foreign investment, I didn't hear any strategies. At one point, we talked to one person over there who said, when, when we asked, why, why will foreigners invest in Egypt? They said, well, for so many years, they propped up the Mubarak government. They'll feel guilty and invest for that reason. <laughs> and um, I wish I could tell you that, that we heard from others very detailed economic uh, uh, proposals, such as you suggest to make it easier to invest. We haven't heard much of that. Hopefully, they will turn to Americans for advice on that because we can give them good advice, and we should, because that's, that's e essential. For them. We, again, we can't do enough with aid from our country, from our government, to get that economy moving. But if they can become attractive to foreign investment, <clears throat> they can have a bright future. Do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, sir. Yep. <coughs> Hi, my name is uh, Gabriel Cohan. I'm with Harvard Law School. 
And my question is, in your meetings in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, if you were able to bring up the concept and the, um, your proposition of conditionality, and if so, um, what were the reactions of the Israelis? And if you didn't have that opportunity, what do you think would be the reaction of the Israelis? Um, let me start, and then you can correct whatever I say. <laughs> um, my impression, to be honest with you, is that we were in listening mode most of the time, asking questions. Um, my impression also is that uh, the sense of fear and uncertainty that we ourselves felt uh, and that uh, secularists felt about for the future of Israel, I mean of, of uh, Egypt, was less palpable among the um, Israelis. They seemed to be much more confident that uh, how this was going to go, or they would know soon how well it was going to go. I mean, I think we've, we've, we had a wide range of views. Uh, one Israeli intelligence uh, official said that, you know, anybody who can predict what's going to happen in Egypt ought to turn in his card because no one is, is confident about what's going to happen. Um, I think they're, they probably are happy with conditionality, but that's just a guess. You'd, Rob would probably know, know much more about where the Israelis are on this. I mean, I, look, I can just, I'll just add, um, as the observer in all these meetings, um, uh, Mr. Craig and Mr. Weber did not ask the Israelis for their input on whether this group should be proposing this or that policy. This is uh, very much their own, uh, their own proposal. Uh, yes. Um, Sarah Stern from the Endowment for Middle East Truth. Uh, ever since the um, <laughs> ever ever since the um, the riots, the demonstrations first uh, occurred in Tahrir Square, um, we have and, and Ahmed have been arguing for conditionality the aid to Egypt, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I have to say that money ipso facto does not equal leverage. Everybody is talking about the proverbial seat at the table that our money buys us, but what good is a seat of the, at the table if we have masking tape over our mouths and remain mute? I think some things that are implicit occasionally we need to make explicit, and when um, We've been on the Hill talking about this. Most um, staffers that we've been meeting with have responded that the phones have been ringing off the hook to stop unconditionally our aid to Egypt, particularly since our embassy was trampled on this fall and you know our flag was trampled on. Um, so I'm very, very delighted to hear you come out with these recommendations. Thank you. Great. Very good. Um, Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, David, on the right. Yeah. Yeah. David Pollack. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dave Pollack here at the Washington Institute. Uh, I wanted to ask, in, in the listening mode that you were in, <laughs> when you talked to Egyptians about two of the issues that we are very interested in, which is Israel and strategic cooperation, right, that you make the centerpiece of this new engagement without illusions. Did they come back to you and say, you know, we would like to keep the peace treaty with Israel, but you should make it easier for us by doing something about the Palestinian issue or by doing something about Hamas? And if so, what would be our response to that? They're, they're sort of reverse conditionality. And on strategic cooperation, did anybody ever say anything about Iran? Like, you should attack Iran, you shouldn't attack Iran, we huh. care about them, we don't. Uh, we want to be f better friends with them, so don't get on our backs about that if we do. And what would be your response to that? Well, we didn't, we, we raised Iran at almost every meeting to find out what people were going to say. And we, uh, we didn't get much of any uh, advice from people in Egypt about it. Um, I would say we didn't even get a lot of advice from people in Israel about it. They described what they thought the situation was. Some of them ventured so far as to say what they speculated might happen. But very few people actually gave us advice uh, in, in either country on, on, on what we should do. In terms of the response of, the, of Egyptians, 
particularly those from the Brotherhood, giving us advice on our relationship with Israel. It, it begins by being a difficult situation since they don't like to say the word Israel, and that made the discussions a little more difficult. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, we, I don't know that we were startled by what we heard, but we certainly reinforced concerns in, in our conversations that, that we had with people in, in Egypt. Greg referenced one <coughs> discussion with a brotherhood leader who repeated that there are 7,000 year old culture and these people have only been here for 60 years. You know, we were here, one person told us we were here and drove the Tartars out of, or kept the Tartars from over running. Your, I have to run back to my history books. You probably already knew that, but I didn't know <laughs> that the Egyptians had kept the Tartars out of Europe until that guy explained it to us. But um, a gap in my learning. But uh, yeah, right. But uh, um, you know, they, they, they the uh, the the they have not learned how to talk about Israel yet, and whether that just whether they will learn that, or there's such a deep seated hostility that they can't learn that. I just think we're going to find out. I don't. I don't know. No, the president has, of course, repeatedly said he's going to abide by the treaty. He usually doesn't call it the treaty with Israel, but international agreements. And, uh, you know, that's a good sign. And some of the things that they did recently were good things. But uh, I think we're still waiting to find, to find that all out. Uh, obviously, you know, whenever, this is not new, whenever you talk to Arabs, the Palestinian issue arises as almost a precondition to solving the problems of the region. But that is really not new. Can I just add, David, I have no memory in Egypt of any uh, conversation where anybody in any of the meetings we had says, we will only accept your assistance if you stop the settlements in Israel. That reverse conditionality didn't seem to be on their minds, and they didn't think in that way. Uh, on the issue of Iran, I don't recall Iran being a concern to any Egyptians in a serious way. To us. We raised the question. We also raised it, as you might guess, in Israel, because we had an opportunity to talk to a bunch of military and diplomatic and intelligence people. But n neither one of those concerns that you addressed was there in our dialogue in Egypt. Uh, Rafi Dezir. Thank you. Did anybody from the uh, ruling circles in Egypt uh, tell you that uh, we will keep the peace treaty as well as all the, all the other international obligations, but we need to reopen the military annex of the peace treaty with regard to the Sinai, which places restrictions on uh, the uh, deployment of the military in Sinai. And if it came up, what was your reaction? I don't think, my, my recollection is it did not come up. We did talk with the, uh, the generals and uh, uh, three or four colonels in the Egyptian military about the challenges of the Sinai and how the United States was concerned about it. Uh, and they, they did not disagree with us. Yeah. Uh, that's all I can remember. It, it, it did not get technical right. about the annex and the requirements and the notice provisions and all that. I'll, I'll just um, underscore the last comment. The, um, um, the group did have, um, uh, well, for, for people that have been trying to do these sorts of, do, doing these trips for many years, the group did have a quite a remarkable uh, afternoon at the Ministry of Defense with an array of uh, major generals and, um, and members of the staff that um, uh, is really quite unusual for, for this. No, no, current. Which Still country, uh, In Egypt. Um, uh, 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 and one of the important messages that the group did receive in this, in this meeting was, uh, um, uh, uh, was commitment to um, uh, uh, fulfilling the, um, uh, not just the treaty, but the military annexes as written. And there was, um, there was specifically no suggestion, actually it's quite the contrary, but specifically no suggestion about the need or the request for, um, uh, for amendment of the, of the text of the treaty. Can, can I just, on that military meeting, because there was something that happened there that was very interesting. At that military meeting, um, the number one general who was presiding over the meeting made a point of saying to us, do not let the political disagreements that may occur among the civilian leadership get in the way of our close relationship with the American military. That is the core of, that's what they, that is the core uh, of the relationship between Egypt 
and the United States. And that's the way I think the military looks at it. Yes, please. Dan Pollock with the Zionist Organization of America. In, in light of the recent events uh, where the President of Egypt has assumed uh, additional powers and the rather mild reaction from the U.S. government so far, can you be a little more specific about actual red lines where you think it would be appropriate for us to actually move forward on executing the conditionality? I, like Sarah said, in my conversation with congressional staffers, I always feel that the argument is very heavily towards not giving up our leverage by cutting aid. And I think that's the institutional imperative that's present in Congress. So I think we need to be at least discuss if we're not going to do it now when he's disabled the judiciary, if and that's in fact what he ends up doing, under what conditions would we actually stand up and say, you've now crossed a red line? <laughs> I was giving you your chance. <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. We spent a lot of time on that question. Uh, and I would say the treaty uh, is a clear red line. You get much beyond that. And, and one of the, the, as we talk about in the, in the report, we talk about informal communications to the Egyptians. There clearly are other things that we would think of as red lines that the American public would think of as red lines. I think we are less sure that they should be articulated officially uh, than, than that we know that they exist, if you follow what I'm saying. So, and, I, and, and in terms of, I, under, I understand this issue is before us right now, but as we've talked about, we, it, this, the government there is relatively new. Uh, we need to allow the, the notion of conditionality, it seems to me, to develop a little bit. And I, I don't have any criticism of the way the administration has handled the situation because we're all sort of learning how to enter. We're learning things about Morsi every day. Some of them we like, some of them we don't like, but we are learning more every day and we don't want to put the relationship in jeopardy uh, unnecessarily. I don't know, does that help? <laughs> well, I think he, uh, um, obviously we're interested, obviously we have views, but I think we've got to be very careful that we don't engage in the day-by-day -day -by -day events inside of Cairo or inside the developments of the Egyptian people so that we become players and suffer um, the outcomes of a day. We have a much longer view. That doesn't change our principles or our objectives or our values. Um, but if we threaten on Monday that if they don't do something on Wednesday, we're going to cut their aid, that's a mistake, I think. And it trivializes the relationship into specific and small events, rather than a well-defined long-term principle of respect for the strategic interests that we've described. Yes, please. Martin Peterson from the EU delegation. With regards speak, to uh, speak up a bit. sorry, is it better? Yeah. Uh, with regards to U.S. aid for. Uh, border security and anti-smuggling efforts on the Gaza border, uh, the status and what are your recomm recommendations for it? The, um, look, I'll, I'll just we'll defer to Mr. <laughs> but those, those very important issues, border security, Gaza, Sinai, counter-smuggling, they come under the heading in this report of the sort of micro uh, conditionality that the group urges to, uh, to, direct a specific, to direct at least a specific amount of FMF to Sinai. Um, so rather than the current system, um, they urge specific targeting of a certain amount perhaps growing over time, depending on um, uh, how the Egyptians address this issue, to incentivize, to use the positive term, to incentivize greater Egyptian effort on the issues you referred to, counter-smuggling, uh, border security, counter-terrorism. Okay. Uh, we're going to take two more questions, uh, Carol and Maury, and then we'll, uh, I know that Mr. Mr. Craig has a plane to catch. Carol? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, <laughs> Please go ahead, by Marina. Marina. <laughs> Some confusion. Uh, Marina Ottawa with the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, I was in Egypt at the same time as you were, as you know. Yes, kept no, on we, we are. Into you you each kept other. following us. And by the way, <laughs> no, you were following me. <laughs> and by the way, the Salafis, those, thro uh, those 
uh, three very endearing guys who looked about uh, 15 year old, all of them, <laughs> thought you were a delegation from the White House. I don't know what you told them. But <laughs> 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 okay, that's, uh, that's not what I want to talk about. I wanted to go back to a point that uh, Greg made concerning the, uh, the weakness of the secular opposition, because it seems to me that that is really one of the crucial elements in the situation in, uh, uh, in Egypt right now. They, they are disorganized, as you say. They are, they are hardly there in many ways. You go visit their headquarters, there is no there there, essentially. It's a very discouraging situation. And I think the weakness of that opposition is very much at the root of the crisis right now because the secularists cannot win elections under the present conditions. So they have been using the courts to reverse the results of the elections. And the Muslim brothers, not strangely, under the circumstances, are using their power to try to get, uh, you know, to put themselves above the courts. But in any case, it seems to me that as long as the opposition is as weak as it is now, we can impose all the conditionalities we want, and nothing is going to happen. It's not going to make a difference. So that the question is, and that's the Greg touched upon this, but then he did not answer his own question. Is there anything that we can do? Is there anything that can be done from the outside to try to get this pretty hopeless bunch of uh, politicians to become somewhat more effective? Well, uh, Martina, I totally agree with your analysis of, that, of the situation. Um, there are a couple of thoughts that we have. We should support the return of the NGOs in a lively, vibrant, robust way. That, that should be part of U.S. policy. It was part of the policy during Mubarak. We should have it there, too. Um, and our NGO activities there, I think, would inevitably end up supporting uh, civic society in a way that would help the opposition. Um, secondly, I think the U.S. Um, – and I say this carefully because I'm not sure I understand the policy exactly – the U.S. Embassy's policy of distancing itself from opposition uh, organizations and individuals, I think, should be much more flexible. Uh, right now, I think the embassy pursues relationships with the new government and with the new leadership uh, with greater energy and focus than they do um, with the dispirited, disheartened, depressed um, opposition. Uh, may I say that one of the interesting things to me is whether or not Morsi's decisions um, essentially to destroy the power of the courts to uh, be courts is going to galvanize the opposition and, and force them um, or in de facto produce a, a coordinated opposition that is something more than just Tahrir Square uh, you know, demonstrations. One would hope that in the face of this kind of action from the central government, which over time could in fact eliminate the ability of opposition forces to participate freely in Egyptian society, that this might be the, you know, the, the turning point or the galvanizing event uh, that could change that. Um, but I agree with your analysis entirely. I just want to underscore what Greg said. What we, there are things we can do. As, as you mentioned in my bio and when Rob introduced me, I chaired the NED for eight years, and NDI and IRI and other organizations, as well as many European organizations, know how to help build political parties, empower uh, opposition, and we can do that, and we should do as much of that as we can, and we should encourage our European friends to do as much of that as we can, and, it, and I think it can be effective. On the other hand, I have to, one parallel that is not helpful in my mind. When I, when I listened to the opposition folks that we met with, it reminded me a lot of the opposition folks I met with in Turkey shortly after the Erdogan government came into power. And they still haven't gotten their act together. So I, 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 I think I agree with Greg on what we should do, but I have to stop short of saying I'm very optimistic about it helping a lot in the short run. Uh, Maury? I look forward to uh, reading the report. Vin, I wish you were back in Congress in a leadership role. And Greg, I wish you were advising the President in the White House. So, uh, l l let me say that uh, I, I think, uh, I haven't read the report yet, but the fact Can I just say I wish it was the other way around? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll vote for that. <laughs> uh, 
I think what's very important is the conditions should be made by the administration in a forceful manner. And while I'm all for Congress speaking out, I think an in-your-face attitude uh, to the Egyptians, you know, do what we say or forget about the aid would be wrong because it not only puts their backs up, but it makes it harder for them uh, to conform to any of the conditions. So I think that is uh, very, very important. Uh, and too much enthusiasm for it publicly, I think, would be uh, self-defeating. I agree. Great. I think we can end then on, uh, on a note of, of, of universal agreement. Um, uh, friends, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we, we at the Institute will be doing other um, transition-related events over coming weeks, but I, um, I'm very proud that we were able to begin this transition with, um, with this report on Egypt. Um, the events are unfolding. Uh, we will know um, different things about this transition in Cairo um, just as every day passes. But if you take this report with you, I think, uh, and I hope I, I speak uh, uh, for my colleagues here, I think it provides a very useful guide in broad strokes to how the U.S. government should, should rethink, recalibrate, and reapproach a way to build a new relationship with this new Egypt. No matter what happens in Tahrir Square, it is a new Egypt. And for a new Egypt, there needs a new approach. And that's what this is all about. So thank you very much for joining us today.